Well, thanks, Michelle, for reading the scriptures for us. And good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Yen, and I'm the pastor of uh, this youth congregation. And I especially want to welcome those of you who are here with us for the first time. And I really hope that you will be blessed by God's word uh, and God's presence and God's love that is here, uh, even amongst us as we are meeting. So this morning, I'd like to start with a rather strange question. What is one behavioral trait that you cannot accept in a friendship? Hey, let me, let, let me show you the question. What is one behavioral trait that you absolutely cannot accept in a friendship? And to do this, I'd like to invite all of us to actually take a poll uh, and please fill in what is the most, um, the most intuitive to you. So you don't have to think too much, but you just put in your responses. What is one behavioral trait that you absolutely cannot accept in a friendship? Making everything about that person, being constantly jealous of others, complaining endlessly, Disappearing when you need that friend. Being excessively needy. Possessing a judgmental attitude. Or hypocrisy. So, uh, all of these are quite negative traits. But the thing is, uh, I've listed them down so that we don't, uh, we are careful not to also have these traits as well uh, when, we, when we befriend others. And we can be a good friend. We can grow in our friendship if we can avoid all of these. Yep. So we are going to just give maybe another 10 more seconds for you to respond. Um, it's anonymous. So you, I don't know who is responding. Uh, but we just want to see, have an indication of how you all feel about this question. Okay, five more seconds. All right. Thank you all very much. And I'd like to share the results <laughs> for, all, for all of us. Yes, you can't click more than one, okay? Just choose one and click one. Okay, and these are the results of what you have just uh, shared. And one behavioral trait that you absolutely cannot stand is actually, for most of you, is actually hypocrisy. And I want to share that actually, it is true. Hypocrisy is one of the worst traits within a friendship. Because, you know, you can't really trust um, a hypocritical friend to know if he or she, you know, is, true, is truly who he or she is. And so that's why it is really tough um, for hypocrisy um, in a friendship to enable the friendship to survive. And I, I want to start with defining what hypocrisy actually is. The dictionary defines a hypocrite as someone who, someone who pretends to hold beliefs or whose actions are not consistent with claimed beliefs. In other words, this person is such a false person that you cannot be sure if you can rely on him. And if we cannot stand it, how do you think God feels about hypocrisy? Well, he's sickened by it. He says that these people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are actually far from me. And he says, I want to have nothing with, to do with such hypocritical people. I'm sorry, my internet is a bit um, unstable and I will try to speak slowly. And as I share this message on hypocrisy today, I preach with a little a tinge of fear and sadness. Fear because this is a difficult topic. And sadness, because we are actually all guilty 
of it, we can be guilty of it. And, you know, hypocrisy has affected our walk with God and also our witness as a church as well. But back to our passage, how were the Pharisees, who are actually the Jewish religious leaders, guilty of hypocrisy? They had focused on observing the external rules of washing of their hands, washing of the cups and plates, as well as other things. And these are whole chunks of regulations to follow under Jewish writings called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is actually a collection of uh, Jewish oral traditions. And these writings are apart from and not to be confused with the Old Testament. But we must not mistake these writings as bad because the intention of the Jews is to protect themselves from breaking God's laws. So if you would imagine with me, the law is like a boundary to keep us in God's goodness and for us to be kept in what's best for us. But the Mishnah is actually a bigger boundary to keep us from, uh, or rather a smaller boundary to keep us from even going out of the boundaries that God has uh, uh, determined for us. But this has unwittingly led to something bad. These Jewish leaders zoomed in on these man-made rules and ignored God's greater commands to love and help others. And these Pharisees were using these rules to criticize and find fault with Jesus and his disciples. Their motive was not to honor God, but to discredit Jesus. And Jesus then gave a follow-up example to prove his point about their hypocrisy. The Pharisees had a special rule that if people were to pledge a certain sum of money to the temple, they can be exempt from giving this money to their parents. So they just need to tell their parents, sorry, this money is korban, which means set aside for God. And so I don't have to give this money to you. Now this rule has the appearance of being very good and very holy and righteous but it actually goes totally against God's fifth command to honour your parents. And so by following this rule, the people can actually put aside God's command. And God is angered by such hypocritical behaviour. And you know what? This is not new to the Jewish people in the past. God was also provoked by Israel's hypocrisy in the in the, in the past, past as well. For example, he says through the prophet Jeremiah about 700 years ago that, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe, safe to do all these things and this happened about 700 years ago when the people actually were guilty of hypocrisy. Outwardly, they pretended to honour God. But outside of God's temple, they were committing all kinds of sin and idolatry. They put up a front of goodness, but their hearts were far away from God. And God punished them by destroying His temple and sending all of them into exile. And God shows through this that he hates hypocrisy as well. But you know, lest we fall into the trap of condemning the Jews and the Pharisees for all their hypocritical action, I think God's message to us today is, are we guilty of hypocrisy ourselves? And let me ask you a few questions, or let me ask us a few questions. Do we claim to be Christian? but our hearts are far away from God? Do we keep up an appearance of faith by attending church or cell group meetings, but do not have a living and vibrant relationship of trust and dependence on God daily in our lives? Or do we hold on to outward achievements, 
like baptism or confirmation or serving even in a particular ministry but are not obeying God's commands in our lives. These can be examples of hypocrisy in our lives as well. And you know what, friends? As I'm speaking all this to you, I'm also preaching to myself as well. As a priest, am I relying on my own position and not also trusting in God daily in my life and serving Him with all of my heart and loving others? Am I guilty of hypocrisy myself? And I want to encourage all of us to examine ourselves carefully because we all can easily slip into this trap of hypocrisy which displeases God. Now, in case you misunderstand me, I am not at all criticizing or condemning religious practices. These are fine and they are even helpful to help us to love God and serve God better. They are fine as long as we practice them with a heart to honor and love God and others as well. And this is also what Jesus says uh, to his disciples. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of all your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And this is the key. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus calls us to worship God with our spiritual disciplines as well as our hearts too. So let's all be totally honest and transparent before God and let Him search our hearts and let's search our own hearts as well so that we serve God with the right attitudes and motivations, especially in this coming week. But at this point, I also want to clarify to us what is not hypocrisy? What is not hypocrisy? For example, singing praise songs to God when you don't feel like it is not hypocrisy. You know, I've heard youths telling me that they don't sing songs during worship because they don't feel like praising God or they are not in the mood. And they think that if they do sing, they are actually being hypocritical because they don't mean it. Now, this is not a correct way of understanding this issue. Why? Because praising God is a decision that we make, whether we feel like it or not. And many of the Psalms in the Bible describes the singer as not in the mood, but also, but then going ahead to decide to praise God anyway. For example, David says in the Psalms, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Saviour and my God. In other words, when you feel down, it is still the right time to praise God. It is still the right time to say to your own soul, Oh my soul, don't feel down. Praise God, because God is fully worthy of our praise and I will still choose to make my decision to praise God. So, this is not hypocritical, but this is a decision that we make. And when you make such a decision, your feelings will follow afterwards. So, don't let your lives be dictated by how you feel. Our emotions can go up and down, but God continues to be faithful and worthy. And we ought not to live our lives based on our fickle emotions. And similarly, some of you may think that when you are feeling depressed or far away from God, it is not the time to read the Bible or to pray. And if you do so, you are being hypocritical. Again, this is far from the truth. 
Let me urge you as your pastor, when you feel far away from God, the safest place, the great, the most safest place to be is for you to come back into God's presence. Being in a place of God's forgiveness and God's love is actually the best place to be because you can leave the sinful and even hopeless situation that you are trapped in. Otherwise, you can actually spiral downwards into an even deeper hole. And God loves and gladly accepts you as you come to Him in humility and dependence. Just as the father in the story of the prodigal son gladly receives his son as he comes back to him. We don't need to earn God's favour through good works before coming back to God. And I know that this is very important for all of us because we may be going through a difficult season. Many of you may be struggling with your faith. You may feel, is it hypocritical to attend a Zoom service or a Zoom cell and claim that you are a Christian when you don't feel close to God? Well, let me tell you, it is not. We willingly and decisively respond to God's grace at this time all the more, and ask for his help. It is like the man who turns to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I choose to follow you, but I find, that I, I find it so difficult. Please come and help me. And as we pray this prayer, God will answer, and God will come and strengthen us and bring us back into his presence. You are not hypocritical if you choose to come back to God when you are far away from God. Now this morning, there are some amongst us who may not know this God and may not enjoy this personal relationship with the God that we all claim, uh, we all believe in and profess our faith in. Well, let me share with you that this God whom we believe in, is real and personal. And He has made you for who you are. And He knows you inside out. And best of all, He wants to have a close and intimate relationship with you. You can find true meaning and purpose for your lives, as well as experience a closeness with God when you receive this, when you accept this invitation from Him. But I wish to go one step further. After knowing that God loves us and accepts us for who we are, He also does not leave us to wallow in our wrongdoings. He wants to clean us up. And to do this, Jesus goes on to tell us where the source of true evil comes from. The source of true evil actually comes from our hearts. Now, this can be surprising because some people, especially in our 21st century, believes that evil comes from outside of us. It comes from our environment. For example, some say that it is the lack of education that causes conflicts in society. Lack of education leads to ignorance and ignorance causes misunderstandings. So therefore, those who cannot afford to go to school cannot be blamed for discriminating against others because they have not been taught better. And therefore, the solution is to have education for everyone. Some other people say that it is the capitalist economic system that creates bad situations like poverty. So we can see that the rich are becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer. And so because you have no choice but to be poor because of the system, you then have to cheat and steal in order to maintain a reasonable standard of living. It is therefore not you at fault. It is the system at fault for creating who you are. So where does evil come from? 
while there is truth to all of these examples that people raise up, it is as, at best a half-truth. Evil and wickedness does not just reside outside of us. It originates from our own hearts. For without wickedness in us human beings, where do these wicked systems actually come from? And Jesus says the same thing. He says this, It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Jesus lists out all of these bad traits that are found in our human hearts. And this is where evil originates from. So my friends, we don't have to look outside. Recognizing the evil in our hearts makes it possible for God's forgiveness in our lives and for us to be rid of the sin that is in our hearts. We need to first take responsibility for this evil in our own hearts, for our own bad actions, and then we can allow God to change our hearts and our lives. So this morning, let me conclude. Firstly, live in integrity, not hypocrisy, towards God. Let us in our own lives be true, transparent, and fully reliant on God. Seek God for who He is, to please Him, to honour Him in our hearts. And as we serve God in all of our outward actions, and when we do our devotions as well, we can then approach God with integrity, not hypocrisy. Next, come back to God even if you don't feel like it. All of us stray at some point of our lives. But you know what? The safest place is in God's presence and not outside of God's presence. And God invites us to come back to Him when we are far away from Him. Coming back, in this way, it's not hypocrisy, but it is our decision to respond to God. And thirdly, recognize our own sinfulness. Recognize that evil originates from us. And by doing this, we can then go on to confess our wrongdoings before God and ask for His help in our lives. And church, I believe that these are the three things that God is speaking to us today. And if you are here listening to this for the first time, know that God's invitation is also extended to you as well. God invites you into a personal and real relationship with Him. And you can experience this for yourself today as you accept His invitation through prayer. So let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for being such a true and a good God, a, good, a God whom there is no lie or deceit, and a God who is totally good and true. And you call us to come into a relationship like this with you, without hypocrisy. So Lord, I pray that you will help all of us examine our own hearts and see the, the things that hinder us from coming back to you and choose to respond to your invitation. And Lord, for those who are hearing this for the first time, I pray for your grace and um, your personal touch to be upon their lives that they may experience you in a in a real way this morning, one that they cannot deny. And if, friends, you are here and you are hearing this for the first time and you want to respond to God, I invite you to pray with me this simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you 
that you invite me to have a relationship with you. I thank you that you are the true God who loves me for who I am and who has created me. And you have a plan and a purpose that is good for me. I receive your invitation and I respond to you today. Come into my life and help me deal with my insecurities, fears, and wrongdoings. And help me respond to you in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.